Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't this a fantastic day? Yeah. Beautiful. A little weather change, right? But all good, all for the good. Dad, warm it up. <laughs> well, we're so glad to, hear, to see you today. You could join us live, or you could join us live on the radio at 98.1 FM, or you can join us tomorrow morning, obviously, on the website. If you're joining us that way, we just welcome you regardless of how you are joining us or listening. This is the day the Lord has made, a beautiful day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's open our worship this morning by singing our traditional and favorite song up here at Forest Lakes Community Church, The Family of God. The words are on the back of your bullet as well. Again, we have a few announcements this morning. First of all, isn't this weather fantastic? Beautiful. Man, we can't beat this, right? Praise the Lord, we have God-given weather, and we're out here in His cathedral worshiping Him. First, any, any first-time visitors this morning? First time being with us? If you could just stand, not on that, don't have to stand, just give us your name and where you're from. Not to embarrass you, but how about in the back there? Welcome, Alan from Scottsdale. How about over here? Lyle and Barb from Chandler. Welcome. Anybody else? Right here. Wendy and Misty from Minnesota. Wow, Wendy and Misty from Minnesota. They came here. About the same weather today, huh? How about over here? Pete and Jane from Glendale. Pete and Jane from Glendale. Welcome. Anybody else? Fantastic. Welcome. Well, we have our usual announcements. You can follow along on the bulletin there, but Tuesday Prayers is still going on for a few more weeks. That's on uh, Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock over at the Hume Front Yard. We've been blessed there, too, to have fantastic weather so far this summer. Uh, women's Bible Study. Women's Bible Study at uh, Warner Cabin. I think they're going for two more weeks at least. And that's on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Uh, make sure you know we have prayer and praise cards up here at the front. And uh, if you have a prayer or a praise specifically, if you would fill that out, um, uh, we'll be sure to pray for that on Tuesday as well as the women uh, cover those prayers in the Bible study. Uh, another announcement this morning, I wanted to make sure we had a special request for prayer this morning. So when we go to the Lord, if you could remember Judy Bandolin's uh, family. Her husband passed away yesterday. Of course, our tithe and offering plate is as you leave at the exit here in the, in the plastic bin. And we're so grateful for the support you've given us this year. Um, greeters. We need greeters for our last two weeks. We have two more weeks of services here, next Sunday and the following Sunday. So we do have a greeter sign up. So if anybody would like to be greeters for those next two weeks, we'd love for you to sign up on that. Our annual meeting is today, so after church today, <laughs> we have our annual meeting. It'll be right after the service, probably within 10 or 15 minutes of us finishing our service this morning. Remember, everybody is welcome. Um, the um, members of the church um, are the ones that will vote. And I was also asked to remind you that, you know, if you become a member of Forest Lakes Community Church, you're not giving up membership of your church 
back in the valley or back in Minnesota or wherever you're from. Um, it, we accept dual memberships, so you can be a member here as well as a member of your own church. Because remember, this is a seasonal church, but we just love it just the same. And uh, just announced that Fred Beasley and Teresa Hawk will be up for a nomination to the board for the next three years at the, at the, at the meeting today. So. Today's guest pastor is John Evans. John and Katie are here from Mesa. Uh, he is at Apache Wells Church. Um, he attended Nazarene Bible, Azusa Pacific, and Word of Living Word University. So he's he's quite a quite a learned person, I would I would say. Um, John spent 15 years with World Vision International. He's also uh, spent 24 years in Palm Springs. Got out of the heat and moved to Phoenix. So um, <laughs> anyway, he's. Uh, He's an adult, been an adult minister there over in Palm Springs as well as a children's minister starting out, but now he's the senior pastor at Apache Wells, so we welcome John and Katie once again to us this year. This morning's uh, scripture is taken from Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Uh, you can follow along in your Bible or on the inside of your bulletin uh, is the scripture, so let's read, to, let's read that now. Daniel 1, verses 8 through 14. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to do this and tested them for ten days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me this morning, and please remember the Bandolin family as well. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for your provision, and that we can gather together to worship you. We thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died so we might have forgiveness and eternal life. We praise you for another beautiful morning and the opportunity to worship you here in your creation. You are so faithful to us. Help us to have that faithfulness toward you. We have many burdens on our hearts this day, and you know each one. We lift every need to you, physical, family, work, and most of all, spiritual. Lead us in your ways and draw us closer to you each moment of every day. We pray your continued guidance on our church here in Forest Lakes. We pray for our board and our meeting later today. We pray you, your will will be done. As you instructed us to do, we pray for our leaders. We ask for your wisdom and guidance, and that they would also seek your direction. We pray for forgiveness and healing of our land, as we haven't always sought your direction as we should. Dear Lord, we now lift up Brother John as he brings your message. Prepare our hearts for your leading and direction. We pray all these things in your son's precious name, and as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we have one hymn this morning, and if you remember a couple weeks ago, I told you when I get to lead, I get to do my favorite hymns. So this is my favorite hymn. So let's sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The words are on the back of your bulletin.
delight to be in the sanctuary of the Most High God. Amen. This is such a beautiful setting, I cannot believe it. I've watched you on uh, the YouTube videos, on the Facebook, on the website. It's a phenomenal thing that uh, you guys have. And we greet you this morning from Mesa, and we thank you for inviting us once again to uh, worship with you and share the Word of God with you. One of the greatest movies of all times was created by Hollywood Pictures. And uh, you know it as the title of Mr. Holland's Opus. And as you look at the movie and as you watch the movie, you understand that Mr. Holland is a frustrated high school band teacher. It takes place in Portland, Oregon, and it's written in the series about 1960. And although he is distracted a little bit from his lifelong goal of writing a concerto or doing some kind of um, musical, Mr. Holland, played by Richard Dreisfus, settles for a job as a high school band teacher. But during his time as a high school band teacher, he continues the determination to write his musical, to write his concerto, to write his opus. But as time goes on, he realizes that the demands of a family are taking its toll, especially when he finds out that his son is deaf. The pressures of his job multiply, and he has to put his concerto, his opus, basically on hold. He recognizes that the dream that he has might not possibly take place. And at the end of the movie, we find a very aged Mr. Holland fighting to keep his job because those who are in charge of the drama department and the band department have decided to save money that they are going to do away with those programs. He's no longer a reluctant band teacher because what he is doing, he finds himself fighting for what he believes and fighting for the position of band teacher, fighting to impact kids' lives because of the arts of being in band. What became a 35-year detour, he is now pouring his heart into the lives of young people. We see in the movie Mr. Holland returning to his classroom after school lets out. Just a few days after, he goes in to gather all of his things, and he finds inside his classroom memorabilia that he has collected over the years, given to him by students, and the tools that he used to teach his band class. His wife and his son 
arrived shortly thereafter to help him in his packing of all of his belongings. And as he leaves his room with that single box in his hand, he realizes that there's a little commotion going on in the auditorium and the school is out. So he naturally decides, I've got to take a look. I've got to see what's going on in the auditorium. To his amazement, he finds the auditorium filled with teachers and students from past and present and a banner on the wall saying, Mr. Holland, goodbye. Those in attendance greeted him with a standing ovation while a band was playing things that they had been taught by him, by his hand of instruction. His wife goes to the podium to make just a little bit of small talk until the guest speaker arrives, who is the mayor of Oregon. She arrives and she begins to address the room of well-wishers and she speaks for hundreds of students and hundreds of teachers along with herself and she begins to say, Mr. Holland had a profound influence on my life and on a lot of lives, I know. And I get the feeling that he considers a great part of his own life misspent. Rumors have it that he's always been working on this symphony, that he was going to make him rich, make him famous. Probably both. But Mr. Holland isn't rich. Mr. Holland isn't famous, at least not outside our community. So it might be easy for Mr. Holland to think that his life has been a failure, but he would be wrong because I believe he has achieved success far beyond riches, far beyond fame. Look around you, Mr. Holland. There's not a life in this room that has not been touched by you. We are your symphony. We are your melodies. We are the music of your life. This morning, as we open the Word of God, we can see in the life of the writer that he too might think that his life has been misspent <coughs> by living in captivity in Babylon. But he would be wrong because he has had the opportunity to speak to kings and individuals. He has had the opportunity to speak to you and to me through the writings of the book of Daniel. God has used him to open to us the meanings of life. He has used him to open to us a small understanding what it will be like when the end of time comes. We read this morning out of the first chapter, starting in verse 8. And when you look at verse 8, you see the entire key to this passage of Scripture that was read to you this morning. But Daniel resolved. The King James Version says that, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Another translation reads, Daniel made up his mind. Life is a series of choices. When you look at a mighty oak tree, what you see is this giant tree, majestic in all of its colors. 
but yet you remember that small oak tree started from a very small acorn. We make our decisions and our decisions turn around and make us who we are. You are who you are today because of decisions that you have made in times past. Most of us don't realize the small decisions that we make, how they will impact our lives and how we will form our life by the decisions that we made. That is especially true when we are young. When we're young, we look at decisions of what college will I go to? What job will I seek after? When should I get married? Who will I marry? Who will be my friends? What movies will I watch? Decisions that we make. What music will I listen to? All of those decisions are, port are important decisions. And the most important decision that you will ever make is will you follow Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? This question, that question is the most crucial decision that you will ever make. And research tells us that most people under the age of 18 make a decision whether they will follow Jesus Christ or not. 90% of those who believe in Jesus Christ make that decision when they're a child, when they're under the age of 18. Choices, decisions, which way do we go? Using the words of Robert Frost in his poem, the road not taken. Two roads diverge in the yellow woods. Which road will we take? We can only take one. As I look at the text this morning, we find Daniel in a crisis He's facing a crisis in Babylon. The decision that he's about to make is going to change his life for the next 60 years. We quickly read over this passage of scripture and we try to figure out, well, really, what is the big deal about what you're going to eat? But to Daniel, it was a huge decision. The first thing that happened to Daniel when he came to Babylon was he was given a new name. He and his three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, were all given new names. Although it's not obvious in our scripture this morning, each one of those Hebrew names that they had had special meaning. The meaning meant to glorify and to praise Almighty God. And when they went to Babylon, they were given new names. Daniel was given the name of Belshazzar. His name in Hebrew, Daniel, meant God is my judge. And now Belshazzar means Baal. The God of Baal will protect me. Then when you look at Hananiah, his Hebrew name means God is gracious. His Babylonian name became Shadrach, meaning command of a coup 
which again is a Babylonian god. Azariah, his Hebrew name meant the Lord is my helper. He became Abednego, servant of Nebo, Mishael, who is like the Lord, became Meshach, who is what? A Q is his Babylonian meaning, a Babylonian God. Because these young men came from honorable backgrounds, King Nebuchadnezzar had a special plan specifically for them. He saw that they came from good stock. He saw that they knew what they were talking about. And so he decided that he would train them for three years. He would give them the best education possible. He would have them immersed into the Babylonian culture. He decided that early on, as soon as they came into captivity, that they would be his servants. They would serve him high in the government. A sophisticated form of brainwashing, if you would. But I can tell you that there was nothing that King Nebuchadnezzar could do that could brainwash Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Their allegiance was to Almighty God and Him only. They would never, ever forget their past. And as we look at our scripture, we see that everything is going smooth. Everything is going okay. Daniel has no problem with his new name. Daniel has no problem with what's going on. But you see in verse 8 that Daniel goes on and he says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Early on, Daniel decided that he was going to make a choice. And he decided that he would not defile himself with the king's food. This is a critical decision for Daniel. And like I said earlier, it doesn't appear to you and I to be much of a decision on what you're going to eat. But to Daniel, it was. We're not Jewish. We don't understand why Daniel would draw the line in the sand on what it meant to not eat of the king's food. Daniel accepted his bondage in Egypt. Daniel accepted his pagan name. So why? Why worry about the food you're going to eat? Someone once said that Daniel made three important decisions every day. The first one was to take part in the pagan education that he was given. He could determine as he was being taught what was truth and what was not. He could be taught and he would remember what the God of gods, the Lord of lords truly was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He put up with his pagan name because he knew in his heart who he was and what he really was all about. And then we see that he had to make a decision about what he was going to eat. And that's where he drew the line in the sand. He knew that he could not go on any farther. And the reason why he could not do that was because he knew that the food that the king ate, the food from the king's table, was not kosher. And under Old Testament law, he needed to eat what was kosher, what was prepared. What he was given by the king was unclean. 
Second of all, the wine that he was going to be able to drink was meant and it was offered to the pagan gods of Babylon. Daniel also knew that if he shared from the king's table in a unspecified, in a unspoken word, basically what he was doing was agreeing with the paganism that was all around him. When we share a meal with someone we have a tendency to identify with them. It implies to us and those that are around that there is a friendship, there's a kinship that is being formed. There's an endorsement, a shared value. When you gather together and eat a meal, there is a oneness that begins to take place and Daniel was not going to be a part of that decision. He was not going to take part in the pagan area of Babylon. If he would have eaten that food, it meant that he was going to compromise his own values. It meant that he was going to compromise his own thinking. And he would not do that. He would not take part of the king's table. You can change a culture, but you can't change a character. You can change a person's name, but you cannot change their nature. Daniel may have looked pagan, but on the outside, on the inside, he truly was a child of Almighty God. Nebuchadnezzar could not change his heart. Now, let's flip this over just a quick minute. What if Daniel would have chosen to eat of the food? You have to remember, he's in captivity in Babylon. No one in Jerusalem would have ever known that he ate of the food. He's so far away from home that word would never have gotten back to his family and friends in Jerusalem. Everyone around him. Everyone's doing it, so why? Should I be the one that's complaining about the food that is being prepared for me? We're in captivity. God will understand. God will know that everything is okay. He knows in my heart that I really would rather eat the kosher food that we had in the past, but we're in captivity. So everything is okay. If you really want to, you can find an excuse for almost anything and justify your reasoning. But Daniel, he did not need an excuse because he had purposed in his heart to do what was right. No matter what happened, Daniel had made a decision he had purposed in his heart. I don't know if Daniel tried to convince Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to follow along so there's power in numbers. What I do know is Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed what he was going to do. Nebuchadnezzar could not change Daniel's heart. 
Why is that? In all of the surroundings and everything that was being done, why could not Nebuchadnezzar in all of his army and all of his position and everyone around him, why could he not change Daniel? Because Daniel's heart belonged to God. Come on. Which brings the decision. Who does your heart belong to? Do the circumstances around you change who your heart belongs to? Even though your body may be in captivity, even though your mind may be bombarded with a ton of different things, who does your heart belong to? 25 centuries ago, we hear the story of Daniel. Things have not changed very much. Because we are being bombarded on every side by things that are being told to us. The media is speaking volumes to us. But who does your heart belong to? That is the decision that each and every one of us must make. That is the decision in which you draw the line in the sand. Who do you belong to today? Today is the day of salvation. If there is any question in any way, shape, or form of who you belong to, I would ask you, I would plead with you to spend a moment in prayer. Go back to the roots of your family. Go back to the roots of your childhood. And purpose in your heart to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. Much appreciated. Don't forget, after the service, we do have our annual meeting. We'll probably be right down in here somewhere. Will you pray with me? To the King of Ages, yes, immortal, invisible, the only true God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Have a wonderful week. And if you're staying for the meeting, we'll be starting that in just a few minutes. Thanks again.